of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, also known as the Second London Confession, also known as the 1689 Confession. We are in Chapter 9, Free Will, which states, Paragraph 1, God has endowed human will with the natural liberty and power to act on choices so that it is neither forced nor inherently bound by nature to do good or evil. Two, humanity in the state of innocence had freedom and power to will and to do what was good and well-pleasing to God. Yet, this condition was unstable so that humanity could fall from it. Three, humanity, by falling into a state of sin, has completely lost the ability to choose any spiritual good that accompanies salvation. Thus, people in their natural state are absolutely opposed to spiritual good and dead in sin, so that they cannot convert themselves by their own strength or prepare themselves for conversion. Four, when God converts sinners and transforms them into the state of grace, he frees them from their natural bondage to sin and by his grace alone enables them to will and to do freely what is spiritually good. Yet because of their remaining corruption, they do not perfectly nor exclusively will what is good, but also will what is evil. And doesn't that describe your life now? It may be more uh, good than evil. But you know what? There may be times where you feel like you will more evil than you do good. The point is, you're willing good. And you wouldn't, and I'm talking about towards spiritual life here. All right? So that is proof God has regenerated you. All right? Now let's get it. Oh, five. Only in the state of glory, after this life, is the will made perfectly and unchangeably free toward good alone. Does anybody have any questions? Did anything come to your mind that once you went, but wait a minute, because it did for me. We're going to get to it when we get to it. I just want to see if anyone, if anything jumped out at anyone you want to talk about. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead. All right, so 1-1, one, one. paragraph 1, reference 1. God has endowed human will with natural liberty and power to act on choices so that it is neither forced nor inherently bound by nature to do good or evil. All right, so three reference, no, one, two, three, three references. Before we get there, I want to just... Do a little word clearing here, to defining words so that we know exactly what's being said. God has endowed human will. What does endowed mean? Huh? Given. Yes. Permanently furnished with a portion or state of being. All right? So this is something we were created with. He endowed human will with natural liberty. Natural liberty, liberty consists in the power of acting as one thinks fit without any restraint or control except from laws of nature. In other words, if you decide you can climb to the top of the building and fly and thus it shall be so and you jump off, then physics will kill you. <laughs> Right? That's basically what it's saying. This liberty is reduced by the establishment of government. It could be for good or it could be for bad. But that's one of the characters of, go of government. Government restrains through the police force. Authority figure, army, right? Laws. All right. All right, so humanity has that ability, the power and force, again, in human terms. Remember, we're talking in human terms versus spiritual terms. In human terms, towards terms of spiritual life, eternal spiritual life. And we're going to be contrasting the two throughout this whole chapter. 
So humanity has that ability, the power and force in human terms to do both acts of goodness and or acts of evil. This is why I said a murderer can still help an old lady across the street. He may cut her throat afterwards, but he can still help her across the street. And, you know, he'll go on and go murder someone else. But people seeing him walking that person across the street will go, what a good guy. What a good girl. Totally not seeing. Right? This goes from the simple to the or mundane. Cleaning up after yourself versus leaving a mess. Cleaning up yourself versus letting yourself go to pot. Not cleaning clothes, not taking a shower, not shave, whatever, all right? Um, and it can go to the extreme. Exterminating a race of people versus standing up for the life of the unborn. Or becoming an evangelist to try to give spiritual life to people. You see? Mankind is not forced or bound and when I say bound or enforced, I mean compelled, pressured, um, unavoidably pressured to do either good or bad by any source outside of themselves. All right? To be forced means to be compelled or impelled, driven forward, urged on, moved by any force or power, physical or moral, driven by violence, threat of violence, urged. All right? And I'm getting to a point here. You may not agree totally, but you will in a second. What I'm saying here is the desire to do the evil, that temptation comes from you. It doesn't come from Satan. Once you express it in thought or in deed, Satan's right there to go, hey, that was pretty good. Why don't you do a little more? You know, blah, 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 you know? But we can't, you know, the, the, a common cop-out is the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do anything. The devil helped you to do it. The devil encouraged you to do it. The devil might have built upon that so you would continue doing it. But once he sees your weakness, then he will try to exploit your weakness. But make no mistake, the weakness is your own. All right? And it's, and it's a character quality of the fall. We all are subject to this. All right? Even as believers, when we, when we are tempted. All right? Here's the references. Matthew 17, 12. This is Jesus talking. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. He's talking to John the Baptist here. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. He didn't say here, but did to him whatever Satan compelled them to do to him. That's not what he's saying. It originates with us. All right? An indictment against all who would be the enemy of God's Son and Savior. Contextually, in these verses, men who would do harm to God's prophet, right? Prophets in the Old Testament, John the Baptist in the New Testament, and God's Son, Jesus. He's applying it to himself and to John specifically. But the meaning goes on and beyond than for those people then who died at their hands. It's applied to us all. We are born in that state of enmity to God and his Messiah. We are born in that state of enmity to the prophets who would tell us that Jesus has come in the Old Testament and the New. And to Jesus himself. We are born in an utter state of rebellion and rejection to him. So your desire for him is proof he is with you. We are born in the state of enemy to God and his Messiah. The gift of grace alone through the gift of faith alone changes a person's eternal situation and the guilt of being the murderer of Jesus, which we were. Evangelion human, good news. He paid the price. 
He did what you could not do and made you a friend of God, a child of God. Even as an imperfect person still, he did that, he keeps that, and will keep it to deliver you to God's presence. Tell me the downside. There is none. James 1.14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Free will. Sinful desire's origin? You. Not Satan. Not demons. And certainly not God. Because James 1.13 tells us, I'll read through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. You see how a sequence is being established, even in Satan tempting you. He's only going to tempt you for things that he knows you want. And that's not saying it has to happen that way every single time. If he knows that Chris has a sexual lust issue because he is, Chris has manifested that through sin, he knows he can always come to Chris and whisper in his ear about lust, about going to watch some porn. You see? Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And certainly once, this is me now commenting, once the desire is stirred from within yourself, within your mind, within your flesh, the, the demonic will join in and whisper sweet sinfulness into your ear, temptation into your ear, all right, to go ahead and carry it out. Next reference, Deuteronomy thirty nineteen. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. The fact that you cannot as a fallen creature choose Christ isn't because God is preventing you from choosing Christ. You are perfectly free to choose Christ. It's just that outside of God moving on you, you won't. Therefore, it's impossible. You see? That's what makes it impossible, is that you're in a fallen state. You are utterly depraved. You are totally depraved. You are fully depraved. You are beyond any human capability of thinking towards uh, uh, spiritual eternal life. Depraved. <laughs> That's how depraved. Now, here's what Roman Catholicism and Arminianism does to change that. They go, well, yes, that's true, and I believe that, except... And I used to say this, and I used to preach this. God, in his sovereign plan for redemption, decreed that in salvation... You are capable of both, as an utterly depraved being, you have the capability of desiring God and Jesus and choosing God and Jesus. And that sounds really good, except for one thing. It removes the sovereignty of God from salvation and makes him subject to you in salvation. It takes God off of the throne in salvation and puts you on it because when you decide, he now has to act. He becomes your servant. Now, I can make that sound really spiritual and, and okay. It's just that it's not. It's not true. Okay? All right. Whereas the above may have pointed towards the ungodly desire. I'm not going to read that. Um, the Holy Spirit in us will commend us as he does every day when we read his word and speak to him, doing good works, strengthening. And, uh, here's what I wanted to say. You know, we're focusing a lot on we have propensity for bad, and our free will will always choose bad. But remember this, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have been empowered because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit to do good. And we do do good. But we hyper focus on the bad things that we do and the imperfections that we do and we 
bind, we bind ourselves into the bondage of self-condemnation that God never intended for you to have even when you sin. What are you supposed to feel when you sin? You're supposed to feel conviction and a little guilt. Maybe a lot of guilt. But not unto condemnation to hell. That has been solved. That has been finished on the cross. And so when you embrace the doubts, you are doubting the cross. And you are telling Jesus that his work just might not have been good enough for you. You see? You see, and, and in this way, doubt in the assurance of your salvation is a sin. Because you're doubting the, the work of God to save you. And, and so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you also live a life as a believer that's like good, 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 bad, good, 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 bad, good, 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 bad, and you're focusing all on the bad. Right? I've done it. Gail's done it. Patria has done it. May's done it. Rich has done it. Ken, Ken Robinson hasn't done it. No, Ken Robinson's done it. Lynn has done it. Nancy never does it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so once again, the confession confesses to us that God has endowed human will with natural liberty and power to act on choices so that it is neither forced, what we do, nor inherently bound by nature. Oh, our will is neither forced nor inherently bound by nature to do good or evil, even in our fallen state. But I'm talking in human terms, all right? The murderer can help the old lady carry her bags across the street. With that, each individual human man, uh, human being, is accountable to God for that reason, for their thoughts and their actions, because we are capable of doing good. All right, so the second paragraph. Now, this is progressive, so just stay with it. Humanity, is the state, uh, humanity in the state of innocence had freedom and power to will and to do what was good and well-pleasing to God. All right, so now we're shifting towards spiritual life and those concepts because that's what we're talking about. God's desire is that his creation would live for e eternity in a state of innocence and grace, right? So in salvation, uh, prior, to sal prior to the fall, mankind was in a state of innocence and had the freedom and the power to will and to do what was good and well-pleasing to God. Now, we don't see many examples of that in the Old Testament in Genesis, the only statement we have to that is that the statement that God would come down and walk with Adam in the cool of the day. All right? But you can bet there was time and that there was good things going on between God, Adam, and Eve. All right? Here, good and godly desires and works are addressed. Our ability to have thoughts and do things which we are told are well-pleasing to God. All right. I want to note two things here. And the first one is that the personal nature of the Father is being shown to us here. That he can be pleased. He can be displeased. He can be hurt. He can be blessed. And, I, and that's true of the person of the, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why you hear the term, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Qualities, these are qualities that we inherited um, from God when we were made in his image in Genesis 126. All right. Second point, note the past tense is being used here. These qualities were call qualities we had. <laughs> Not that we have. We don't have them. It's pre-fall versus post-fall. What is being said here is that humanity pre-fall had a state of innocence which allowed us, enabled us um, to, to have God-pleasing thoughts and to do God-pleasing deeds. And again, we're talking now, to, uh, uh, speaking of um, eternal, spiritual eternal life, those kinds of things. Things that don't break that. 
ability, that state, all right? The entire context here is about what we once had and do not have anymore. So here's where I got, I started getting a little questioning, all right? So let me just go on. So why state it like that if people can do nice, good things, right? Fallen people can. They can be charitable. They can be givers of themselves. Um, all of these in human terms. The world is full of charities and foundations that, of lost people who do good to other human beings. All right? So why state it like that if, if, if unsafe people are capable of doing those kinds of things? Rich. Because God uses them in the furtherance of spreading the gospel, whether they're saved or not. Well, yeah, and, and we, can, we can expand on what you just said because the, what's the furtherance of the gospel? It doesn't have to be evangelizing and discipling and teaching Christian truth. I mean, it could, be, it could even be the bad things that people do or did or some of the evil that's in the world that God is using to bring mankind to the point where Jesus manifests establishes the gospel, and then the ultimate end of delivering a people into the presence of God who are holy and perfect. All, nothing is going to waste in the world, including the evil. I don't know how things are used, because there's plenty of depraved evil going on in the world, but nothing is going to go to waste. And think about that. Like, think about in our glory state, taking classes in eternity, that that could be one of the classes. How evil was used for good specifics. Wouldn't that be cool, Rich? Yeah, I got a quick example was uh, when I took uh, Gail and Rich to the bus station for the bus. Now, the first time they went, um, nobody recognized them and the bus left and everything and they got stuck. So this time I brought them and uh, they get on the bus and I was going to put their bags in the, inside the bus thing and the bus driver got all got all red with me. He goes, oh, no, no, I know these people. I got, you know, he wanted to do it himself. Now, while he was standing there, I got the impression that he wasn't saved or a Christian, but, you know, he, you know I, I can say that his grace towards them was uh, God enhanced, you know. God was kind of looking out for him, you know. Mm -hmm. Here we go, let's see whether he's a Christian or not. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So, an answer to the question, why state it like that if people can do good things? Because until one sees that God, right, the triune being, is real, they are fallen and God provided by dying in our stead an eternal life of blessing and God's presence and love. Until a person knows this and agrees by faith with that, we will never attribute to God the credit for any good we have thought or performed in life. It will all be rooted to some degree in selfish pride. All right? So people can do good things, on human terms, in human terms, and and f be totally unable to do good things that will get them salvation. All right, they will, in fact, um, those good deeds really are will be thoughts and works of darkness, because what they're strengthening in the end is a selfish pride, and a self reliance, and a self righteousness. So it could, it could be, in human terms, the most beneficial, beautiful, charitable thing ever that will be used as evidence against that person at the great white throne judgment that gets them sent to hell. Do you see that? So when you, when you see that, then you realize that there really is no good work outside of attributing that good work to God. That's the only time a work is good. All right, reference, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7.29. 
See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. And now, this is really a summary statement of how Adam and Eve were created and the fall. And it's been that way ever since. We were, through Adam and Eve, created upright. But because Adam and Eve sought out a scheme, ever since then, mankind has been seeking out schemes. What kind of schemes? It doesn't matter as long as it bypasses God as needed for salvation and eternal life. It could be Buddhism. It could be bowling. It could be food pantries. It could be... Satanism, it could be Buddhism, it could be Mormonism, it could be anything that offers some glimmer of light for eternity as long as it doesn't include you fell, you deserve hell, a savior came to save you. If you would repent and believe, that salvation can be yours. The gospel. And that's what Satan has done ever since. And there's a plethora of ways he has created to uh, replace Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. All right, what do I have written here? Man started upright, standing straight, made by God this way, holy without sin. And note here, in that verse in Ecclesiastes, the focus is on God there, his will and his work. He made man upright. But, second half of the verse, mankind rejected God's plan, his word, his will, and his ways, and instead chose to find other plural schemes. I meant to look that word up. Doesn't matter. We all know what schemes are. Plans. Methods. Oh, maybe I did look it up. Ways of a plan. Yes, I did. A combination of things connected and adjusted by design. That's a scheme. You see, uh, belief systems are schemes. Belief systems that don't include Jesus Christ and salvation are the schemes of men being addressed here, regardless of whatever that scheme is. All right? Now, in the garden, what was the scheme? Did God really say that if you eat this fruit, you will die? No, 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 no. Here it is. If you eat of it, you will be like him. And he presented it not as a usurping thing, but as a helping thing. You'll be able to help God out. You weren't created to help God out, brothers and sisters. We were not created for that. We were created to worship God and enjoy him forever. That's it. He's the king, we're the servants, the subjects. He's the father, we're we're the children. He's the groom, we're the bride. All right? And, and the point of all other means of an eternal salvation is you don't need Jesus, you're fine. Right? And you hear it all the time. You hear it around all, you know, whenever you're at a funeral, you'll hear it. You know, he's an angel with God now. And, and you know, one day, we'll, you know, we're all born and we're all made in God's image and we're all God's children. Right? Don't need Jesus. These are all schemes of the enemy and schemes of fallen man. Two, three. Yet this condition was unstable, the ability to do good, so that humanity could fall from it. Now he's talking about before the fall. This this state of innocence was unstable so that humanity could fall from it. And this is where I had my problem that I had to really think about. I had to stop my study think about this for a little while. I prayed on it for a little while, and then I started writing. Here's what I wrote. I find the statement interesting and a little unsettling. How could God make a creature in his own image, bless it, declare within himself that man was very good, Genesis 1, 26 through 31? How could he do that? How could in that being very good still contain the element of you could lose this? You could choose against this. And there's only one possible... My battery's dying. 
There's only one possible solution to that dilemma. One explanation. This might be... Oy. Ah! <laughs> You're having a moment. There's only one possible reason that we'd be made this way. And God would still call it very good. That everything which God has permitted from creation to this very day until the great white throne judgment, everything he has permitted in his providence and has led to the salvation of mankind. Exactly. All right. So our ability to fall was very good because it was part of his plan. He knew it had to happen. Um, but to say it all led to man's fall, to say it all led to man's fall, evil, suffering, and death for mankind alone is to see very short-sightedly compared to the sight and purposes of the God of eternity. You see what I'm saying? You could say, well, how could you call that good? I mean, look at all the evil that's, that's come out of the fall and still going on today. And I'd say you're being short-sighted because this is not the end. All right? When Adam fell and Eve fell, that wasn't the end. When uh, all the evil that was perpetrated in the Old Testament occurred, it wasn't the end. When Adolf Hitler killed six million Jews, it wasn't the end. All right? And it all is playing some part, which I don't know, you know. And I, I don't understand. But one day I think we will. I think we will. I think we'll understand. And, and I guess, and it may be part of the process will be that class I was talking about earlier. How all the evil in the world was used for good 101 specifics. All right. To say it all was and is to, it all was and is to lead us to Jesus and his coming, the atonement and salvation is an awesome fact, and it's a true fact, but that's not the end for the soul. It's the beginning for us. We've got, I mean, I'm saved, praise God. I mean, you know, I owe everything to Jesus, but none of us have entered into the fullness of the inheritance yet. We have it. It is, it is done. We have eternal life. We have divine health. We have uh, freedom from the desire to sin. Liberation from it. Ultimate. We just haven't entered into it all yet. It's all waiting there for us. It's the resurrection of our bodies. That's when all of it gets fully established. Who we will be forever will be then. Even now, we've not entered into who we will be forever in its fullness. Nancy. Just a couple of things. I, I just love this. When I read it the other night, the same thing, that the state of innocence, you know, that whole idea. And then you look at that it was good. And there, God gave them one thing, and that is don't eat of that tree. So they had to have the ability to choose or not choose that tree. Mm-hmm. And I just come back to the thing that Jesus said when he was talking about the woman who was wiping his feet with her tears and her hair, that he who has been forgiven much loves much. Right. And so without the fall, without all of us having gone through seeing what we you know, are capable of, we don't love him much. Right. And that's the, that's the only thing that I can kind of land on this is paul's this. what she's expressing here is the same thing that paul expresses when he um talks about um the grace of god and and how um and how in his weakness god was shown strong all right now I don't want to for a minute say it's it's okay to sin, that God is pleased when you sin, but God uses everything, okay? Your, for us being confined in these bodies into a lifetime, until we die, of imperfection, 
means that from the day of our salvation on, we will have a constant reminder of our need for grace every time we sin. And in that understanding that, yes, I sinned and I deserve hell, but he has saved me, he is still saving me, he is still saving me, I'm still his child. All your continuing sin as a believer, has to, I have to say that, as a believer, all that continuing sin can do is reinforce to you and, and deepen the understanding you have and the experience of God that you have in grace. It's not justifying sin. Shall we continue to sin that grace might abound? By no means. Even if that is one of the benefits. Because in 2 Corinthians, God tells him that's the benefit. When he says, I pleaded with God three times to remove this from me. And each time he said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's God saying to Paul, you have to learn about my grace. I'm not taking this away. For the rest of your life, it may be. All right? I'm convinced, you know, John MacArthur talks about when we get to that verse, um, you know, that the... The thorn in his side was, a, was the, fo- the super apostles spreading slander about him, lies, and causing the church to reject Paul and accept these guys. And, and, and the, hey, there's some truth in that. But you'll see when we get to the verse, he's speaking to God in terms of, his, of what's going on inside of him, not what's going on exterior to him. So that all may be true, that that's what's happening, but he's addressing what's going on inside of him. Maybe it's bitterness, resentment, hatred, desire for revenge. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, I mean, it could be a plethora of things. But the point is that he's addressing his internal condition, not what's going on around him. All right. Let's keep going. We may or may not get to it tonight. So everything that's going on in the world, all of the evil, all of the good, all of the unsaved, all of the saved, all of the wars, all of the beautiful things, the plan and the end of the plan of God, his plan and purpose, his will from before the foundation of the earth and everything going on subsequent to that because of his providence is for an eternity shared A people embraced by God to be his family, brought into his glory and perfection, who know him for who he is in his fullness, and to be worshipped and enjoyed by them. That's his plan and purpose. And it's not going to be every human being that's ever lived. It's just not. And, and God's plan of having a people for himself was the plan all along. So every evil thought and deed performed ultimately played whatever small part in forwarding God's end. And, and I can apply this to all things as a sum total of the evil and the good, but we can also apply it to your own life and see that reality. All of your sinfulness all of the things you did wrong, all of the things you did right, all played a role in your butt sitting in this pew tonight. All of it. All of it had something to do with that moment where you went, God, save me. I often, you know, I think about my miserable childhood and the bad decisions I made. And, you know, what if I became a cop? You know, then I would have more money, I would have a career. And you might not have had Jesus Christ. All the drugs that I did that would have disqualified me, qualified me from being a cop. Well, if you didn't do all those and, and you became a cop, you might not have came to faith in Jesus Christ. Everything happened in my life and in your life perfectly, according to God's plans and purposes. Leading up to that moment when he went to the Holy Spirit and he went, go get him. It's their time. It's all good news. Evangelian Roman. All right. All right. Galatians 3 6. So when the women saw 
that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she, she took of it and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. We often skip over the who was with her. We always picture Eve is off walking by herself, and she's walking near the garden, you know, near the center, and all of a sudden, oh, she's like, let me look at the tree of life. And then Satan comes down as a snake. Adam's nowhere to be found. He comes along later. Hey, Eve, what you doing? She's like, I'm eating fruit, right? No, he was with her. That's why he's guilty. He was supposed to be her head and her protector. The confession tells us here that our innocent condition was unstable enough for us to fall from it. And I say that if a man can fall, the man will fall. And I think God knew that. Seems like it was pre-known. And, though, uh, and, and through a fall, the circumstances which led to it were declared, oh, and though a fall, the circumstances which led to it were declared very good. And from it come the ultimate good through Jesus Christ. It's all good, man. So Adam and Eve fell. They made a bad choice. And it's a bad choice. And I say that regardless of any ultimate good, the consequences of that choice for Adam and Eve meant suffering. All right? And it meant something had to die for them to be Reconciled, And that's exactly what happened. God killed an animal and covered their nakedness. That's the gospel in, in Genesis. It's a rudimentary, and they believe that because he did this, that they were reconciled to God. And so we're justified. So that their fall didn't make them feel good about their own righteousness, right? To be sure. But then again, that's exactly what we all must come to terms with individually. And God accomplishes this, this through our sin to those granted the eyes to see. People who aren't granted eyes to see and ears to hear, when they sin, they don't go, oh, I'm going to go to hell. I'm displeasing God. That only happens to people who God moves on. Do you see that? When Christians sin, they feel bad about it. Eventually, the greatest truth about God and Christ and salvation becomes a reality, and it's this. We will never, in our flesh bodies here in this life, merit anything favorable towards grace and salvation. We need Jesus Christ. I need him as much today as I did the day I was saved as the day before I was saved. 10,000 years from now, I'll need him just as much. As the Lord told the Apostle Paul when he complained to him about his own personal trial, and this is what I was talking about earlier in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10, I'm going to read to you. He said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul continues, therefore, this is Paul talking, that was, Jesus was talking. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul comments on that, saying, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. He's not saying, I'm going out and sinning because that's how powerful God's grace is. That's a misunderstanding and a misapplication. What he's saying is, I don't like to sin. I feel horrible about my sin. But the one thing my sin has showed me is how much God loves me. And he saved me through Jesus Christ. And Jesus loves me. And he died for me. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, that tells me that when we have this kind of attitude towards God, we rest in his grace. We, we instead of heaping guilt upon ourselves and, I mean, a uh, condemnation upon ourselves, if we focus on the kindness of God, 
that that is the power of God that ultimately will help us to overcome sin in our lives. Hitting people over the, book, over the head with the King James and telling them, you know, it says in Romans, you know, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God and this and that. All it does is, is, is cause us to be more guilt-ridden and, self, and, and condemned. It may be true. There may be truth to what they're saying, but it's not going to, that's not what's going to make us finally overcome. It's seeing the love of God and his kindness in us as his children, even while, even though we're sinners, that ultimately will be the key to us overcoming sin through the power of God. So he says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, he's not saying that he sins so that he can be strong. What he's saying is when he is weak, it is when he is his weakest that he is the fullest experiential understanding, the fullest experience of the grace of God in his life. And that propels him to go on, to continue. That's the strength of God. Perseverance. You see that? The fall was not Adam and Eve's ending. It was their beginning. Nor is it ours because of the gifts of grace through faith. Amen? And that's where we're going to end. So we'll be on 3, 4 to, uh, next week. I'm sorry, did someone say something? Does anybody want to say something? Do you have any questions? Do you want to make a statement? Do you, do you, does, does this make you feel good? Does it make you feel better? Does it does it make you feel God's love for you, Richard? Yeah, thank the Lord for that. Amen, amen. Um, and and you know, I used to preach that 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 verse of the kind. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. I used to say, as a pastor, well, listen, no, 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 no. that has to do with salvation. The kindness of God is manifest on the cross. Now that's totally true, but I was limiting it. It's the kindness of God also after we're saved in our sinfulness when he forgives us and says, you have my grace that deepens for the Christian a love for him, a desire to live for him, and ultimately, praise the Lord, the ability to conquer it. Amen? Even though we won't perfectly do this. Okay. Somebody hand Gail the microphone now. Oh, somebody want to say something? I was just going to say there's a bunch of people on Zoom. If anybody has any questions, they should unmute themselves. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank